What's up, guys? Welcome back to the Last Round Boxing Podcast. You got me, Rudo. You got me, Pablo. Also, L. And this is the Last Round Boxing Podcast. Uh, I said we just kind of get right into it. Uh, let's answer the question that everyone in the boxing community has been wanting to wanted to know. The Was it a low blow or was it legal? This past weekend, we saw the fight between uh, Usyk versus Du Bois in Poland. For the uh, for the three uh, titles of heavy at the heavyweight championship level, and uh, it ended kind of controversial. You know, Usyk got the decision ninth round uh, TKO stoppage. Uh, with it was with the jab, so that was kind of interesting. You know, we don't normally see uh, TKOs like that. But earlier in the fight, I believe it was in the fifth round, Du Bois landed a borderline punch that seemed to have. Uh, Stirred up quite a bit of controversy. Uh, what are you guys' thoughts? Because to be honest, I don't think it was. Yeah. Uh, that this, this just like you said, everyone's asking this question, you know. And I think it's kind of hard to say. There's like two different camera angles mm. that have come out, and one of the camera angles it looks like a low blow, and the other camera camera angle it looks like a legal shot. And um, obviously, a lot of people. I, I'd say the majority of the people right now are leaning towards it, it was a lo- uh, it was legal a legal punch um, I saw Daniel Dubois tweeted out saying um, you know Usyk is a great fighter you know he's giving him his props because Usyk was uh, dominating the fight but he said it was a travesty that he he uh, got the fight taken away from him because mm-hmm. he believed he won a lot of people believe he won a lot of people believe he knocked him out um, personally I think it was a legal blow as well. I think it was borderline. Usyk sometimes puts his shorts up a little high, and it, it's it's high. You know, it, the trunks are high when it's over his belly button, and the shorts clearly were over his belly button. So belt shots are legal, you know, it, in that sp- specific circumstance, and it, that's what it was on this past weekend. And uh, man, they robbed Daniel Dubois. Mm. Yeah, I feel uh, personally, I thought it was a legal blow. I thought. Honestly, he uh, he should be a unified, you know, uh, world champion right now. But uh, I feel this is one of those things that there's always going to be, you know, a back and forth. Was it or was it not? People are going to say it was. Some people are going to say it isn't. It's, it's just one of those moments that no one's really going to be able to decide whether or not it actually was or I, or it wasn't. But like you mentioned, uh, Usyk has the uh, tendency to have his trunks high up, you know, over his belly button. And he had it for this fight. And... Uh, you know, a shot down there, you know, in the belt line, essentially, it's pretty much right there and on, on the bottom half of his torso. So, technically, it's a legal blow. Uh, but I think uh, Usyk really benefited from this uh, from this moment because I think this was the first time I've ever seen a fighter use all five minutes of, uh, <laughs> of the low blow. You know, what the, you know, they give them, you know, time to recover. I've never seen anyone use all the time. Except this past Saturday with Usyk, so uh, all five minutes he used every single second he could. Wow. He was like high forward. Yeah, he yeah. stayed. He stayed on the ground. You know, he was like sitting on the ground for a good like minute and a half, maybe two. Mm. Stood up, went to the corner. You know, did a couple stretches to you know stretch it out, and then you know went back into it. But uh, yeah, uh, I remember when I first saw it live. I thought uh, I thought it was a, a low blow by the way that Usyk reacted and the way he wasn't moving. But then once they went to the replay, and then I saw the frames, you know, it was a, uh, it changed my mind. I I thought the ball landed a a beautiful right, right to the body. Uh, and something that Usyk has shown to be very uh susceptible to, you know, those body shots. You know that's interesting because uh, what I was gonna say is a lot of people when they receive a body blow, boxers sometimes tend to exaggerate their their effects, right? They might just like stay on the ground for a while and. Um, but if it was an actual, let's say it was a knockdown, sometimes they'll like get right back up and see, look, oh, I actually wasn't hurt, but I was just trying to play it off, maybe get like a minute or two off, you know, a little break. But for him to take all five minutes, that means A, he was hitting the balls and actually did hurt, but from the camera angles, we clearly saw he wasn't. So B, he was just taking time to take a breather. Mm. You know, he was, he took that time to take a break in the middle of the round and you know, that shows that maybe he was hurt to the body yeah and to be honest uh, another reason why i believe it was a legal blow and i believe uh the boy should be 
the new undisputed heavyweight champion is because of what you said. And I think if we look back at Usyk, his track record, he typically likes to have his trunks above the belly button, covering that belly button to cover most of that body because that body is weak. Even in the amateurs, he's been dropped. Arthur Betterbeef, the champ, one of the champions at 175, probably the best uh, champion at that weight, he dropped Usyk with 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 the body shot. Yeah. I believe it was also I believe it was with the right hand too as well, and that was in the amateurs. And there's been other instances where I believe uh, I'm not sure which fight between Anthony Joshua, Anthony Joshua where Anthony Joshua with the body shot. hurt uh, Usyk with the body shot, and it was visible that yo that shot affected him. And there's been other in other fights as well. I think Usyk has been very good at not only has he been been punched. But there's been other instances where they have reoccurred. I remember seeing a fight, him in the amateurs, where he also gets hit, and it's kind of borderline, but he kind of plays it off as if he got hit low to the belt, below the belt line. So I, I think Usyk knows. Usyk knows that, that was a very clean shot. It was borderline, yes, but when you have your trunks high up, you know what I'm saying? Like, evidently, it's, that's, that's clean. Yeah, I mean... Uh... This this might be a little kryptonite for for Usyk. Maybe he's shown a a, a weakness in the armor because mm. he's a very accomplished fighter, right? A, amazing amateur career, and now as a professional, he was undisputed at uh, the cruiserweight limit, and now he finally moved up to heavyweight and he beat one of the top guys, Anthony Joshua, and became a three belt champion right now. So and he's on his way, or he he appears to be on his way to undisputed or trying to. You know, become undisputed at the heavyweight division. He only has one champion left, Tyson Fury. Tyson Fury, Gypsy and King. The Gypsy King. And, you know, this could be, you know, he, he's a very great fighter. Great skills, you know, fundamentals. One of those Ukraine, Eastern European styles mm. that are just like, you know, just I- incredibly difficult to, um, to beat, you know. But this might be a weakness for him. Maybe his body can't take that much punishment. You know, maybe... Um, Th- that's the game plan. Maybe that's a blueprint to cracking Usyk's style and uh, breaking him down is going down to his body. Yeah, to be honest, if I was Tyson Fury, this would this fight would I, I would be very excited to get this fight. I think I'm not sure. It's really hard to kind of decipher or get into the mind of Tyson Fury because he's kind of a crazy, uh, yeah, wild card. But I believe um, if you were to see this fight, and I'm pretty sure you saw this fight. Uh, I think he's be very motivated to now actually want to take the fight with uh, Usyk. Just really concentrate on that body, and then you really use his six foot nine stature and try to impose that. But definitely, the body would be a very key key thing that he yeah, would have because, to target. Because honestly, I mean, Daniel Dubois, yeah, he's a he's a prospect, but he's nowhere near like the top level of the elites, mm. you know. Um, and listen, he has a. This isn't his first. Okay, we'll we'll get into the the the, the stoppage now, because okay, nine ninth round TKO, um, Usyk dropped him right one time as well. Usyk dropped Dubois. Yeah, in the eighth. In the eighth, and then he finished him off in the next round, and the it was it was a simple jab, and Us you know Dubois went down and uh, listen. I'm not saying he quit, but he quit like <laughs> Danny Dubois. He. He, I saw recently he came out with a statement saying, um, I looked at my corner and they, they told me, wait, um, take the count and then get up. And I got up and he's like, I didn't quit because people are criticizing him, you know? And I think it's true because this isn't the, the first fight that he's done that in. His his last uh, fight that he stepped up was uh, when he fought the juggernaut. Um, the juggernaut. Uh, Joe name? Joyce. Joe Joyce. Joyce. The juggernaut, Joe Joyce. And... In that fight, once again, Danny Dubois took a knee and let the, the referee count to 10. So this could be a pattern for Danny Dubois. You know, he, he does have ama- amazing power, um, but he's not, I wouldn't say he's the elite at the heavyweight division. And if someone like Danny Dubois could knock out Usyk with a body shot, imagine what a six foot nine Gypsy King, pound for pound, one of the best fighters in the world is going to do to Usyk. Mm. Uh, yeah, I feel this fight, uh, you know, at most guarantees. You know, gives hope to Dubois to uh, you know maybe get a rematch, because uh, if it wasn't for that controversy, this would have been a uh, a one and done with. You know, because besides that whole controversial fifth round, uh, low blow, uh, Usyk dominated the whole fight. Yeah, it was clear who was winning. Uh, you could tell there's levels to the sport. 
you know, props to Dubois for taking the fight. Uh, when it comes to the heavyweight division, you know, the best fighters, you know, are typically those in their 30s, you know, early 30s, mid 30s, you know, they're, they're, they're up there and uh, Dubois is like, what, 25, 26? He's still very young. Uh, so, uh, for him to step up against arguably the best, uh, heavyweight fighter, uh, you know, shows big balls. Uh, so I respect that from him, but going to the whole, uh, the stoppage, uh, I do believe he, uh, he did quit. I believe he, uh, he, he, he uh, the, the round prior to the stoppage, the eighth, uh, he was, uh, you know, uh, he was lucky to have gotten out of it because Usyk, you know, dropped him in the final final 10, 15, 20 seconds of the of the eighth round and uh you know, he was able to get up and be, essentially be saved by the bell. So it was only like a matter of time before, you know, he was going to be taken out, but uh I think he uh he maybe did the tactical decision of uh, you know, not, you know, uh standing up right at 10 essentially because uh you know, he guaranteed another uh Perhaps another payday, you know, against uh, Usyk, you know, another chat, another shot at the championship, and uh, I feel a lot of people would back it up since the whole controversy happened. Yeah, to be honest, I don't think I, w- I would ever say this uh, sentence, but the guy who quit should be the champion. Yeah, <laughs> that's kind, kind of interesting. interesting. Yeah, exactly. Very interesting how that works. Um, yeah. yeah, it's what you said. Uh, Usyk definitely showed that he's levels above the boys every round. Uh, Usyk was dominating every round uh if it wasn't for that uh if if it was a, if uh the referee would have counted it as a legal blow you know uh the boys would be the champion but i think you should give it to him just based off the fact here there should be a, a rematch just because uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you guys saw this but there was a video that came out the puerto rican referee i forget his name i i just remember him because within the clinches he always says uh nobody throw nobody throw nobody yeah. throw yeah because there's been some referees who do get hit in between the clinches and whatnot but i just think it's kind of funny that's just kind of what stands out to me but he clearly said he was stating in the in the locker room before uh, the fight he was he was stating the boys and his team and his coach saying what was what was considered legal what what um what he was gonna, gonna say that's legal that's clean and his team the boys his team stated that Usyk does typically have his trunks above the covering the belly button and so the referee was like yeah if it's right here indicating that like you know it's the at the belt line but like since it's covering the belly button i'm gonna I'm consider that like a clean and in the fight he doesn't consider that clean so i believe the boys should get a rematch just based off of that and he has that puncher's chance too yeah uh but i don't think that's gonna happen to be completely honest i mean there's there's two things for it because firstly the promotion I mean they don't really especially Usyk he doesn't want to go back and fight him again when he was a better you know he's he is a better fighter but he just literally his body might just not be it um, and also I I mean Usyk he's getting older sure he wants to fight the the champion try to become undisputed try to get his dream of be two way uh, undisputed champion and uh, I don't think it's for him to go backward it's like it, it feels like He'd be going backwards, you know, trying mm. to fight him Dubois again. And truthfully, I don't even think people really want to see it. You think the public would want to see that? Uh, the people who claim that it was a... Uh... <laughs> the people who... Uh, I believe... Yes, I believe the people who claim that it was a legal blow. Mm. I would say so. Like, me, I want to see that again. I don't know. I, I, Me, personally, I wouldn't. No, I don't. I wouldn't want to see it. I, I want to see Usyk against other big champions. Yeah, I would. I I, I don't want to really want to see the rematch. Really it doesn't really rematch. interest me. Uh, Dubois doesn't really interest me as a fighter, to be truthfully honest. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't been too impressed from yeah. him at the moment. I feel he needs a couple more fights right now in order to kind of you know prove himself. Not only that, but kind of gain confidence back. You know, although one can say that he did knock out the. <laughs> the uh, unified champion at the heavyweight division, you know. That is true, but yeah. uh, history is not gonna remember that. Yeah, they're gonna only remember that Usyk stopped him in the ninth. And it was just some controversy, and that's about it. That's yeah, that's all it's gonna remember. So uh, the best, I feel, the best choice for the boy is to, uh, uh, you know, just build himself up. You know, get some other fights. You know, uh, fight other contenders, perhaps. You know, and uh, 
you know, like you said, Usyk is getting old, Tyson Fury is getting old. All these top elite heavyweights are already close to their uh, to the final, uh, uh, you know, hill. Last couple fights. Yeah, a couple fights left, you know. Deontay Wilder showing that he doesn't really... He only has a couple, you know, handful of fights left in the vault. Tyson Fury seems to be doing his own thing. Uh, Usyk uh, is already, you know, at that age. So, uh, a lot of these top heavyweights are, you know, already getting ready to see the back door so for a fighter like the who's 25 26 who's still young uh you know just his chance to just build himself up yeah, he could wait it out honestly <laughs> he could he could wait it out he could do the, there's a lot of options for him he's still very early in his career so uh yeah let's see uh what him and his team decide to do but uh stick into the whole uh subject of uh heavyweight boxing uh there was a clip that was going around of andy reese uh, he was, he recently had a live stream on on Instagram, and uh, someone had commented on the live stream that he was uh you know to, he was ducking Wilder. They told him to stop ducking Wilder. Where uh, Reese responded back saying that ah oh, no one's ducking Wilder. You know uh, I'll fight him if he decides if he if he if he decides to pay me what I'm worth. You know this and that. You know essentially going off on Wilder saying that uh, if they pay him the amount that he's asking for, then he'll gladly do the fight. Now, my question for you guys is, is Andy Reith worth a $10 million paycheck? Yeah, I saw that. Um, 10 M's, that's what he priced himself at. I mean, listen, I, I feel there's there's a opinion, there's two arguments, right? One is he was the former uh, unified champion at, at the heavyweight division, you mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? He for six months. For, <laughs> for six months. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Hey, but if you leave out that minor detail, it's like a footnote, you know, in like books. It's yeah. like they put that asterisk next to that sentence. The annotations. And they like go down the page and find it. Like, because I mean, he, he like, listen, hey, if I was him, I'd be saying to my grandchildren, you know, I was the unified champion at the heavyweight division. I mean, division. he was. He was, because it, it's, it's true. But obviously, you know, if you look at it more closely, um, he no title defenses you know it was a fluke of a victory and then it was swiftly (laughs) (laughs) swiftly clearly um corrected by anthony joshua when he outboxed him completely for 12 rounds um so listen yeah he could he i'm sure that's what in his mind andy Ruiz is thinking i'm the unified champion you know and i'm sure another thing that he's thinking is you know, if I go into this fight, there's like a 90% <laughs> chance I'm going to get knocked out. You know, listen, uh, his, la- his last fight with um, Chris Ariola. His last fight with Chris Ariola, Chris Ariola, who was like 40 years old by then, mm. um, he dropped Andy Ruiz and he hurt him very, very badly. Imagine what someone like Deontay Wilder can do to him. You know, and Andy Ruiz is one of those guys as super slick boxer who... You know, evades punches. He's a come forward type of guy who throws fast combinations going forward, but he gets hit. And that's a perfect combination for Deontay Wilder. He just needs that one. Yeah, I mean, you bring up a good point. Uh, Do we know exactly how much he was getting offered originally? No. No. Oh. Yeah, uh, in his live stream, he was saying how uh, they were trying to offer him the same amount of money that he made in his last fight. So whatever they were, whatever he made against Chris Ariola is what they're offering him right now for a Deontay Wilder fight, which is why he was also upset because he's like, no, like, I, I, his whole, his whole thinking was that, you know, he won and so he keeps going up and up and up, you know, and then, you know, as he goes up, you know, the more money you get, you know, stuff like that. That's, that was his way of thinking. So he feels that he deserves, he's worth a lot more than what he was, uh, or what he made in his last fight. Well, I believe, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I don't think he's going to get, I don't think he got $5 million against Chris Ariola. So I'm going to guess he got somewhere in the ballpark of like $2 million, $3 million against against Chris Ariola. So I'm guessing that's what they're offering him. Yeah, I think $10 million is a little, quite a bit amount. I don't think he's worth $10 million, But I don't think he's worth 2 or $3 million, Especially if he's going up against someone like a uh, Deontay Wilder. Deontay Wilder is is a household name. Like you know, like is what you said before. His his you look at the numbers. His KO uh, stats. He's got like a ninety some percent KO ratio. Anyone who sees that, like even the casual, is gonna wanna 
tune into that cuz you, yeah, you never you never know. It could be a firework fight, you know, for the for anybody to watch. Yeah. It could be an early night or it could be a long night, but you know what the Ante Wilder's right hand comes in clutch. But Andy Reese he brings a couple things to the table as well. He's kind of like um it, he was kind of like not known and all of a sudden he was known. And he's got a good uh, style for a heavyweight too. Like he moves pretty quickly, not only on his feet but also on his hands, and he throws quite a bit of punches as well. Sure, they're not as hard as as some of these other uh, heavyweights, but it's quick, it's precise, uh, it's like a three punch combination. He's in and out, so I think you know that could give a little bit of of struggle to Wilder, you know, given that he's never faced anyone like Andy Andy Reese. Yeah, I think there's like some truth to what Andy Ruiz is saying where, you know, he should get paid more than his last fight. Especially when you take into consideration, you know, he was fighting Chris Ariola, which, you know, not he's not a household name just like a Deontay Wilder is. Because at the end of the day, this 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 pay comes back to how much money can you generate? Mm-hmm. And I think the fight Andy Ruiz and Deontay Wilder can generate more money than a Chris Ariola versus Andy Ruiz fight. So if listen, I don't know how much he got paid for his his last fight, but should he be getting paid ten million for his fight with Deontay Wilder? I don't believe so because I don't think he can generate that amount of money. But maybe you know, in a, in a, a, a couple of M's, he should definitely be making. You know, so there is some validity to what he's saying in the aspect of yeah, I should be getting more money because people know me, and this fight could be a really big fight if marketed correctly, which it should be pretty easy, honestly, to market a fight like that. You know, it's just for the casuals, like we're saying. And so, yeah, I mean, but I don't think it's it's $10 million amount. Mm. So Yeah, also, uh, I, I, I think we're incorrect. He, his last fight was against uh, Luis Ortiz, wasn't it? Oh, I think it might have I been. think it was, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, okay, but the... The, 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 the point still stands. The, the point still stands. <laughs> the point still stands. He, he still struggled against... Yeah, Ortiz old. hurt him too. <laughs> Ortiz hurt, hurt him, uh, and Ortiz uh, he had, he struggled against a essentially like a fifty year old man, you know, <laughs> a grandfather. A gra- yeah, he he still struggled. And, that uh, man is writing his obituary. <laughs> what the hell, like? <laughs> so I mean, the point still stands. Chris Chris Ariola or Luis Ortiz, uh, Andy Ruiz has not looked good, and also he uh he's a fighter who's uh very inconsistent when it comes to performances because. Mm-hmm. By far, his best performance was against Anthony Joshua, that first fight. You know, no one expected him. He did the impossible. Props to him. But then the rematch happened. And he came in heavier than he did in the first fight. And he got completely outboxed the whole night. Uh, he then fought Ariola, gave a bad performance. He then fought Ortiz, gave a bad performance. He fought essentially four or five times since 2019. That's... Nothing, you know, that's little amount of fights for a man who, after the first Anthony Joshua fight, was predicted to take over or be one of the big names in the heavyweight division. But clearly, uh, Anthony, uh, Andy Reese, uh, is very undisciplined, you know, very inconsistent when it comes to his performance, and uh, he's really not lived up to any of the uh, hype that was given to him after the the Anthony Joshua. So for him to, for me personally, for for him to go and ask for Ten million is uh I think it's it's delusion. You know, it's 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 proper delusion. Uh he's not a fighter who's who's who can generate that amount of money by himself, especially. You know, Wilder, you put him up against anyone, you know, he's he packs up a house, he sells out shows, you know. Uh uh and he's a fighter that like you you guys mentioned, casuals would love to see him because of the right hand. He's always a, you know, it's, he's the bronze bomber, you know, he's always hype. And uh, Andy, Andy Reese, on the other hand, just he just really isn't, you know. Yeah, another thing to consider is like like we're like we're saying, Andy Reese was one of the guys that just like got overwhelmed by the 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 fame, but mostly the money. Mm. You know, just like you were you're talking about his performances with Anthony Joshua, he had his best and his worst performance against the same person. You know, and just like you said, thirty pounds heavier, he definitely looked like he didn't train much much more flat footed. Did nothing, absolutely zero in that fight. He just got completely outboxed, and you know he's had uh, he's been exposed before. He's had a lot of problems outside of the boxing ring, so he's one of those guys that like <laughs> money. You know, money and him don't work well together. So him asking for this 
very big amount of money may be a, a sign of him just saying, hey, listen, I might, I'm might, i probably going to lose this fight, but at least I'm going to get a bag. And <laughs> I can go back to having like two more years of fun until I, I can I have to go fight again. So. Yeah, yeah. I was I was kind of thinking the exact same thing. Like the reason why he wants so much amount of money is because I think he's having problems personally, and you know, unfortunately, we've we've had the opportunity of seeing that you know kind of unfold on social media and stuff like that with his uh I'm not sure if his he's baby his baby mama baby let's mama put it that drama. way baby mama drama <laughs> and that and that sort of stuff. Also the the right away. From rags to riches, you know, that li- wanting to live that lavish lifestyle, getting houses for mama, papa, homie, having X Rolls amount Royces, of Rolls Royces, right? yeah. different types of other luxurious cars as well, chains as well. Chains, uh, gotta yeah. have the chains, outfits, you know, like everything, you know. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, so I think that's that's what it is, but uh, I think. Well, uh, another reason why I really want to, I do want to see this fight. If we can't see AJ versus Wilder, I would like to see Wilder versus Reese. Because I think it goes back to the thing, like that story of Rags to Riches. Like Andy Reese's story changed from from night and day, really. He really went from not having anything to then having not only millions in his bank for the first time, but also having the amount of eyes on yeah, him as I'm, well i'm sure his phone was buzzing after that fight. <laughs> so I, i'm pretty sure he's maybe hungry again as well like he's seeing the, like yo the funds are low everyone left, me. everyone left me i don't have the same eyes that i once did um you know i'm hungry you know i really want this fight i'm you know he's he's called out uh wilder he's put various clips of him training and whatnot kind of prove i think even when uh, aj uh fought robert helenius he was gonna fight uh white and uh, they were looking for an opponent, and, and Andy, Andy Riz Reese what, chimed, in. chimed in with a clip saying, "I'm ready, Eddie. Hit me up. I'm ready." So I think I think that's what it is. Mm. He wants money. Yeah. But yeah, so that's the whole. I guess that's the whole spiel with Andy Reese. Let's see. We'll have some time to see what what action or what decision you know PBC especially decides to take with. Uh, oh. Al Heyman, you know. Thank Al Heyman. Thank you, Al Heyman. You're saving boxing. <laughs> no, but yeah, we'll see what, what Al Heyman PBC decided yeah. decided to do when it comes to Wilder because uh he's a uh, you know, he desperately needs a, I feel he needs he needs a fight. Uh he's coming off a first round knockout against uh uh Hellenius. Uh but I mean I feel he needs a couple more rounds in the bank, especially, you know, if he wants to uh become champion once again because you know, you have Tyson Fury and Usyk. You know, edging closer and closer. Let's see what Us or what. Let's see what Fury decides to do after the uh, Francis Ngannou fight. Hopefully, he decides to call him out. <laughs> Hopefully, they decide to finally start doing it. But the rematch. <sighs> There's a lot of moving parts in the heavyweight division right now. Very moving parts, but it's slow. Yes. Very yeah. slow. Very slow, so uh, it'll take some time to see what happens. But hopefully, uh, we get to see some big fights, especially in the heavyweight division. Uh, overall, there wasn't very much boxing uh, over this past weekend. Uh, besides the uh, Usyk against uh, Daniel Dubois, we had top rank uh, with Jared Henderson once again headlining. Uh, you another know, heavyweight. another heavyweight, another heavyweight prospect. Uh, you know, he uh, he fought back in July. You know, or it was back in July, so he had like a. a Nearly yeah, fast. He he got back in the ring fast, which is you know really good. Activity really matters, especially for a for a prospect you know coming up. And uh, well, I didn't you know we didn't. I don't, I don't believe we watched the fight. Uh, but based on you know what social media was saying, you know he put up a good performance. Even though there's people cri- criticizing the uh, level of opposition went down for this one. But regardless, you know <laughs> top rank really uh, I feel top rank is the. Uh, the best uh, promotion to be in if you're a For prospect, prospect? Yeah, if you're absolutely. top, if you're like a, a up and coming rising prospect, I feel like top rank is the best one. Do, do you guys agree with that? Absolutely, I think so. I mean, like the amount of coverage that they show for their prospects coming up is, you know, it's it's you, you really don't see it in any other promotion. Mm. Like they they really try to build up their lower fighters, their prospects coming up, their rising stars. They try to put them on IG. They get them on Tiny Mike. I don't know if you've seen those little interviews yeah, that they have. That. You know, they, they really try to push them out and, and show their clips, you know, tag them, do all of this, especially when they perform well. Yeah. You know, if, if they get a knockout, oh, you already know it's going to be all over top rank. So 
Yeah, top rank definitely is really good with prospects. Yeah, top rank is definitely w- w- one of the better ones doing it right. I know Showtime that they really don't show awful. A- any TV time to even just the undercard. Yeah, awful. Yeah, at all. So that's kind of weird. Um, I think another people that do it good sometimes is uh, Matchroom. Matchroom as well, Eddie Hearns. Yeah. Eddie Hearns, uh, Fridays and whatnot. And now we're, we're seeing a little bit of some of these other like smaller networks like uh, Pro Box TV. They have uh, shows every Wednesday or every other Wednesday, Wednesday night. And then Overtime Boxing as well. It's like a collaboration with The Zone as well. They're not promotions or whatnot, but they're little small companies, you know, trying to give, you know, exposure to some of these other uh, guys who don't normally fight on bigger TVs, bigger networks and whatnot. So, yeah, I would say Top Rank is doing one of the be- one of the best ones. Uh, going back to Showtime, though, uh, even though they don't really do, you know, that much of a job with promoting their prospects, I feel they do a great job promoting big fights. Not only big fights, I'm talking like they do a very good job promoting the top fight. prospects fighting against mm-hmm. top prospects because they have the whole Showbox. Uh, I think it's Showbox, Next correct? Generation. Next Generation. Mm-hmm. T- and uh, they always headline those fights with sometimes like undefeated fighters against undefeated, you know, these undefeated prospects going at each other. And I think that's really good you know it, it really uh you know you have these two prospects see which one's better you know mm. you know it really in i think that's awesome i think that's something that more promotions you know should should be doing to a kind of maybe alienate who's you know who's who's the real deal who's not you know stuff we like that the, the fakes and the you know we out all the people that aren't on that level yet and just get the best of the best and the cream of crop yeah, uh, I, I kind of like that too because typically that comes out on Friday, Friday nights, and it's typically no pay per view and whatnot. So I think it's free for the public to see. And it's, some of those fights are pretty entertaining. Like they go back and forth because when you put a prospect against another guy who also has zero defeats, like he doesn't want to lose that uh, that uh, undefeated uh, streak. So they're both going to bring their A game, put 100%. And if someone gets a knockout, well, that means they're pretty good. Knocking out another guy who's also on the same similar path as him. No. And then we see him later on the the cards of bigger Showtime fights. Yeah. So it's a it's a really good uh, building up process for uh, what, what Showtime does. Another thing that Showtime and, and PBC be doing right is uh uh this undercard for the uh, Canelo versus Charlo. Uh, they released the uh, the the main card for it. Uh. They have first off leading off a middleweight showdown between Elijah Garcia and Armando Resendiv. Mm. Uh, next up is a junior middleweight fight between Jesus Ramos against Erickson Lubin. And then uh, the co-main event, they have uh, the return of uh, Ugas against Mario Barrios. Is that the co-main event? Yes. I suppose. thought it switched. Did it? I, I I think so. I thought I thought it's uh, Ramos Ra- and uh, and Lubin. Yeah, it could be. It could be actually. Yeah. That one could be. Regardless, I feel these are pretty. That's a pretty solid uh, yeah. undercard. Solid. You know, you get the return of Uga. See what he does against uh. You're gonna whoop Barrios <laughs> against Barrios. <laughs> <laughs> against Barrios, you have a uh, Ramos stepping up against uh, Hammer Time, Erickson Lubin, and I'm not really too uh, sure about this middleweight one. I'm not. I'm not too. Uh, I think familiar. they're both on the familiar. Right? Uh, yeah, they're yeah. It's, 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 it's regardless. It's, it's good matchup making for uh for uh this Charlo fight against Canelo. Uh, I feel they're trying to really uh sell this as uh, uh as they're trying to make this as the best card of the year, you know, because it because yeah. it's a whole undisputed undisputed. Let's make a whole spectacle out of it, having good fights, fireworks. You guys agree? Yeah, I mean that should that hopefully that's the goal, and and you know that's gonna make for a more entertaining night and a better night for boxing fans, you know, giving them what they want, which is good fights. Sometimes these promotions just put a really, really good main event, but then, like, the undercards, they don't give any thought to them, and then they're just boring, and just, they're just, they just bore you out, and you don't know who they are, you know, all this stuff, but one of the things I personally like, and I know a lot of boxing fans like, is when the whole card, the whole night, you're entertained, not just the last hour of the of you know of midnight or something. So hopefully that's what they're trying to do, and hopefully they can achieve it, and hopefully you know it, it follows through. This is a very good, very good fight. We got Ugas, just like you said, Barrios, Lubin. You know I'm excited to see those guys. You know because they're hungry and they want to get back on top. Yeah, because I was gonna ask. I know uh you know about Canelo's last fight. He fought on the zone, but who fought on the undercard of that? 
Do we know? Uh, the writer? Yeah. Oh, wow. John Ryder against Canelo. Who fought on the undercard? No, we just know it because Canelo fought. I think Showtime is doing a good job of, you know, having a, a stacked card from top to bottom. Prospect against prospect. Undefeated against undefeated. And then other guys who, you know, Barrios, uh, Ugas, and then Ramos and Lubin. You know, that's going to be a action-packed fight. We know, we all know those guys. They, they come to bring it. So that card is going to be stacked. You know, Showtime is doing a pretty good job on that. Really trying to sell that, you know. Yeah, I think that's going to be the card of the year, to be honest. Or uh, it's, it's probably going to be the event because I feel the best fight of that night is going to be the uh, Ramos against uh, mm. Erickson Lubin. Because yeah. stylistically, it's, uh, it's a very good matchup. Mm. You have two very, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, offensive type fighters. You know, uh, Ramos, I believe his last fight was against uh, Spencer, right? Spence, yeah. yeah, and he, uh, and an undefeated uh, prospect, uh, and he he whooped him. Mm. He absolutely whooped him. He uh, he really surprised me. What's his name? Uh, El El Chango. El Chango. Or? El Chango. Ramos. <laughs> so Ramos. funny, but uh, uh, yeah. So uh, that fight, I feel, is going to be the fight of the night. It's very uh. Very juicy, very fiery, you know, the type of styles that they bring. But hopefully that, that fight, that whole event is coming up soon in a couple of weeks. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm very excited for that. But, uh, you know, switching topics. Uh, like I said, there was not much boxing for this weekend. So uh, I just kind of wanted to ask you guys. Uh, I made a community post a couple of days ago, like a day ago or so, uh, on YouTube. And uh, I asked the, uh, the, the people... Uh, which which one of these fighters had the uh, the toughest road towards undisputed? And I had uh, I had Terence Crawford, uh, I had Alexander Usyk, uh, Saul Canelo Alvarez, and I had uh, who was the last guy I had? Oh, Josh Taylor. There you go. Yeah. Uh, I, and I wanted to you know I asked the people that question, and uh, according to the polls at the moment, uh, Canelo was leading the pack. Uh, but I wanted to ask you guys, who do you guys think had the hardest road towards undisputed well i think it comes down i think me personally for me it comes down to two people it comes down to canelo and it comes down to josh taylor mm. the, i believe their run for undisputed was the toughest and the most just the toughest for them yeah um for like terrence crawford he fought you know the unified champion spence you know, who already had three belts, he didn't have to go take it, strip it away from all the other champions. Hmm. And um, the other, uh, Usyk as well, I, I can really only remember his last when he f- actually became undisputed when he uh, knocked out Tony Bellew in Fantastic. He was already undisputed. Oh, was he already undisputed? Yeah, oh, that wasn't. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. Um, nonetheless, uh, Canelo and Josh Taylor are in the leading. You know, I, I, leading the pack for me, and I believe per, uh, Canelo had the the toughest fight. I, I agree with the polls. I think that uh, he, he just he he stripped it from all the champions, man. Like one by one, one by one, and you got to take into consideration as well. He talked about this as well in one of the interviews after the press conference with Charlo. You know, because everyone asks him about the weight stuff. You know, Charlo's moving up two weight divisions, and he answered. You know, I'm the smaller guy. Ever since I moved up from, like, 154, I've been the smaller guy. But I'm cabron. <laughs> I'm not, I'm still, first of all, I'm hard. I lie. But he, he brought up an actual, a really good point is that Canelo is small. He's, like, 5'8". You know, he just has a very wide body, and he doesn't cut a lot of weight like a lot of other boxers. And, he, listen, he fought um, Liam Smith, right? Callum, Callum Smith. Oh, Callum Smith. Yeah. Smith brothers, um, he fought Callum Smith, who's like a six foot three giant. <laughs> like this guy is huge. He's massive. He's a monster. And Canelo, you know, passed with flying colors. He fought Billy Joe Saunders, a super slick boxer that no one can touch. Undefeated. And Callum Smith was also undefeated. Mm. Knocked him out. Mm. And then he fought Caleb Plant. You know, another very slick six foot. Tall, strong, uh, six six one, six one. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Champion, another champion, Unde- undefeated, young in his prime, and he knocked him out. Like and, and Canelo doing this all at the the, the height of five eight. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? So um, short kings on top. Short kings on top. Like for real, I think his run was the toughest, and the the way he did it as well was just you know crazy to see. 
to be honest, I really want to agree with you because just on that sentence alone, he took the belt from every other champion who moved up in weight, and then he went down the line one by one and took everyone's belt that he needed to take away. But, I mean, I would say I have Crawford as – it's either him or Crawford because it's kind of hard – to become undisputed when no one else wants to fight you. Or when there's issues about money. The networks can't seem to agree on how much everyone gets. You know, they're cut. So, I feel like that's kind of like beyond him. You know what I'm saying? Yes, he took it against a guy who, you know, Spence was Spence was drained. Yes, that, that shit was pretty easy. But, you know, it's kind of hard. No one really wanted to fight him, you know? Crawford has that, uh, you know, his ring IQ is really good. Uh, he's really athletic, and he's able to put, blend those two together in that style. Plus, he's able to switch back and forth from left to right. But, I mean, yeah, I would say it's between between them two, Canelo or, or and Crawford. Yeah, I don't buy that because what, uh, Spence was able to make all those big fights happen just fine. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, I feel like it's possible. And I think Crawford, people say that, oh, I, he, you know, Crawford won, or everyone was scared of Crawford. I don't really think it, that's what it was. I think people were scared of suspense. I mean, what, what he was doing was, he was actually fighting big names. Crawford hasn't been fighting, you know, you know, let, let's say his last fight at, uh, before um, Spence was Sean Porter, yeah? Yeah. And um, listen, like, after that fight, Sean Porter retired. Like, that was his last fight in boxing, you know. And once again, it was a very weird stoppage as well. The father just stopped it. It's not like it's not like Sean Porter was unable to continue where, like, he couldn't stand up. It was like he, he was – his dad claimed that he was scared that his son was just going to get hurt more. <laughs> which is like – I mean, that's boxing, man. You put him in the ring. Like, <laughs> yeah, there's a chance he might get hurt. Like, I'm sorry, bro. <laughs> Change sports. But, you know, uh, so I don't – I personally don't buy that. And, you know, when we talk about run for undisputed as well, um, it's just, I, yeah, I just don't believe his run was the hardest. I mean, his path was the most difficult. I don't, I don't believe so. You, you know, it's funny. It's, it's funny that you said that. I had no idea he had said that. But w- when you said that, it reminded me of, of his fit when, when the whole team fought uh, Spence. His dad looked like a, uh, an African uh, warlord or something like yeah. that with the hat and the glassy look military as fuck. So I would assume he would have that similar attitude with, yeah. with his son in every fight. But no. I, I think it's funny that you said that. Yeah. Uh, so you guys, you said uh, Canelo and... Uh, Josh Taylor. And, jo- and Josh, Josh Taylor. Taylor. And uh, you Can- you said Canelo and Crawford. Close second. Close second. Uh, personally for me, I would say uh, Usyk and Josh Taylor had the hardest runs. Uh, you know... What Terrence Crawford did uh, at 147, you know, he's also been undisputed at 140, but that's probably one of the easiest runs, to be honest. Uh, but his run at 147, uh, you know, he fought Jeff Horn to become champion. And, uh, you know, Jeff Horn, uh, you know, he only defended, he didn't even defend the championship. He, he lost it straight away after uh, he beat Pacquiao in a very controversial fight. Uh, so, yeah, so Crawford, you know, even though he only technically fought two champions, which was Jeff Horn and uh, and and Spence and uh, even though he took apart Spence so beautifully, he fought in uh, in Dago as well. Didn't he? Be, didn't he fight? But, but uh, I'm talking one forty seven. Oh, one forty seven. Oh, because yeah. at one forty, didn't he be in Dago to yeah, become yeah, undisputed? He fought yeah. like he no, be, yeah, yeah, he be well, he be Postal too at one forty. You know, mm-hmm. I'm talking about one forty seven. Because mm-hmm. uh, his one forty run, he was undisputed, but it was pretty easy. But yeah, it's 147, so he technically only beat two champions, even though he did it great. Uh, I don't think it was the toughest route. Uh, for Canelo, you know, he fought these undefeated fighters, uh, uh, and he did it in the span of 11 months. Mm. He did it in less than a year. That's right. that, It's insane what he did at 168. But if and honestly, I feel the toughest route was Josh Taylor. Uh, he fought uh, Ivan Berenchik to become champion first, who was undefeated during that time. Yeah. He then fought uh, uh, Regis Porgrace, uh, 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 who was also undefeated at the time. And then uh, he became undisputed once he, he absolutely dismantled, dominated uh, 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 Ramirez. Jose Ramirez. And, uh, you know, I'm, his whole run towards being undisputed at 140 was so impressive because he he, just, he was just absolutely, you know, he would have some dogfights in there, you know. 
the fight against uh, Berenchuk was pretty tough, but the fight against Pro Grace was was insanely tough. It was a really back and forth. He he mm-hmm. he went through adversity, and uh, you know he was able to come out top. He also won the whole uh, the super uh, Muhammad Ali the Muhammad Ali trophy. Yeah, you know yeah. his whole uh, resume at one forty is has been absolutely incredible. What's happened afterwards is a shame, you know, with whole Catteron and Tofimo. Anyway, that's not that's that's besides the point. Point <laughs> is, I I personally believe Josh Taylor had the uh, toughest. Toughest I could, run. I can see that, you know, and that's that, when I was looking into it, I said, yeah, you know, um, now people will probably like if let's say they go to um, box work right now and go to branch, they'll see like he has three losses now. And it's like, well, you, you have to take him at the time when the fight actually happened. And when the fight actually happened, just like you said, branch was undefeated. And listen, he's one of those guys that brings it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like he, he's a tough, he's a beast in there, you know, so. He goes in there with aggression. He goes in there, you know, with passion, with everything. Uh, he hits hard. So, yeah, that, that, that's no easy walk in the park. Uh, Josh Tanner also knocked him down. And he won pretty convincingly that fight. Mm. Um, the thing with Ram- you would say he dominated Ramirez? You would say he dominated? I would say so. Uh, Jose Ramirez? Like, midway to the end of the fight. Okay. Yeah. Two yeah. knockdowns. Two knockdowns, yeah. I, I, I'd say I don't. I don't want to say. I want to use the word dominate. I think it was a close fight. But my only another uh, point of contention is with the Regis Pro Grace fight. A lot of people think that Regis Pro Grace won that fight. Man, it was a very, very close fight, all out war, just like you said. Um, and that fight was close. A lot of people. A lot of people think uh, Regis Pro Grace got robbed in in that night and. It was a tough night for Josh Taylor, and I can't deny his resume at 140 and his run to Undisputed was 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 great. You know, it was fantastic. Okay, yeah, I mean that that is a point to make. You know, against Josh Taylor uh, for his run, uh, but I mean, let's let, let's go to Canelo's run at, at 168. During the time when Canelo went up to 168 and became champion, 168 was not a hot division at all. It uh, that was 160 was the division to be at. 168, no one was doing anything there, you know. Uh, people criticized the the whole run because they deemed they they it was seen as uh, you know a pretty weak division to be in, mm. and so I feel that's a, that's one of the flaws or one of the uh, the uh, the arguments against Canelo's run at 168. The fact that 168 was not a high level type of division. But the champions are strong. We had Caleb Plant, Billy Joe Saunders, and Callum Smith. Who had they fought before though? Who, who they hadn't really. Caleb Plant had only became what he fought. What was his name? Uskategi. Us- Uskategi Us- Us- to become Venezuela, champion. I think. I think it's Belsman or Colombian. Something. Yeah, at one sixty eight, like dismantled him. He dismantled Uskategi him. Was a monster. Mm. You know, he's a heavy hitter, hard puncher. Um, that was just knocking people out, and Caleb Plant absolutely dropped him. Dropped him twice with. Pillow hands, you know. But he, <laughs> he, dro- he dropped him twice. Sweet hands. And, yeah, sweet, sweet hands. <laughs> he dropped him twice and he outboxed him beautifully. Another thing, I mean, I understand what you're saying. A lot of people, um, uh, a lot of people, especially when Canelo uh, knocked out Billy Joe Saunders, they're saying, oh, Billy Joe Saunders hasn't fought anybody, this and that, this and that. Listen, you can't deny their skills, though. Like, um, they're doing what they're doing. Yeah, they might not have fought a Can- another Canelo Alvarez or someone close to his level. But what what we have seen from them is anybody else, you know, at a B, like a, any B-level fighter, they've beaten them with flying colors. And I think that's, that, that can give you a little measure of how good they are. So, you know, if let's say they had like tough fights in their previous, they, they, they got like very narrow split decision wins and then now they're champions and this and that. No, it's like they were they were beating everyone. No one could touch Billy Joe Saunders. David Lemieux did absolutely nothing against Billy Joe Saunders. Mm. And, you know, Billy Joe Saunders is a very slick fighter. <laughs> Callum Smith, another big, heavy, big, big guy at, at 168. Caleb Plant, you know, we, we can say, yeah, the resume might not be the best. But a lot of people, there's another thing. A lot of people always, like, l- let's say, let's take the hype for Jared Boots Ennis, for example. Okay. Everyone is on this man's train. Mm. Everybody. He's the future of 147. Okay, well, who has he fought? We could use the same argument. Who has He hasn't fought a, 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 another A-level fighter. Though. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But my, my simple point is people can, can be sold to a fighter and, you know, praise him. 
when he hasn't shown that he's at a stardom level. You know, uh, mm. like just like I said, Boots Ennis, um, he's people are already want him to fight Terence Crawford. First of all, I think that'd be a, a very bad match for him. <laughs> but he's never shown he can, you know, um, fight at that level. He's never shown he could, you know, beat someone at a Terence Crawford level. Just like Caleb Plant or Billy Joe Saunders, they've never shown that. But they've beaten everyone else pretty fucking convincingly. So, you know, I I, yeah, I, I could see both sides. Like I, and that's why I think Canelo had a, had a harder run. Man, I hate people that say that Canelo had Canelo's run at one sixty eight for undisputed. Uh championship was easy i think that a lot of people were just being haters to be honest because it was those guys those opponents are legit legitimate opponents like sure some of them like uh billy joe sanders hasn't fought since you know well he got his eye broken <laughs> he had never gotten hurt and he he gets hurt against canelo uh caleb plant uh yeah he fought another champ he fought another good guy who was an ex who was a world champion at one time uh, David Benavides, he did a good job. He did a good job. And then you got Callum Smith, who at 175, he looks like he's rejuvenated. He even looks stronger now. So this goes back to saying that, like, oh, Canelo's run at 168 was easy. No, nah, you know, some of these opponents are still decent, you know. They're still really good. But I think if we I think we all ha- can come to an agreement. I think Usyk's run for Undisputed, for the Undisputed Crown, was probably the easiest one out of those four. I would say so. Yeah. No. You don't think so? No. Who who? Okay, let's go through it. Yeah. Who? Let's let's talk about Usyk's run for undisputed. Okay. Um. At cruiserweight. Yeah, cruiserweight. I'm not sure who he beat at cruiserweight. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Wait, 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 back back to the before before we move to Usyk. Uh, I want to go back to the Canelo. Yeah. You know, you know, you people. I feel one of the reasons, one of the other reasons besides the whole, uh, how weak the 168. Division was uh, the reason being an argument being for uh, uh, the but, Canelo. Yeah, against Canelo. Why couldn't he? Why didn't he become undisputed at one sixty? When when he was there, you know, he had being Golovkin. Uh, uh, you had Charlo still a champion. You had Dimitris on. Uh, you had Boo Boo there. If if why 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 did he need to go up to one sixty eight to become champion when he could have became. Or become undisputed at 168 when he could have had a, every chance in the book to become undisputed at 160. I feel that's another argument that they have against Canelo for going to 168. I mean, yeah, he could have, but... Then why didn't he do it? He could have. I mean, maybe is his way. I don't know. But to sit here and say Bobo Andre is Andrade <laughs> is a harder fight than Caleb Plant... Or Billy Joe Saunders, I think, you know what I'm saying? If, or or Jamar Charlo. Jamar, okay, see. A Charlo but, during the time? But who yeah. Has, who has he fought? Uh, the Dervichenko? He destroyed Dervichenko. He, and then Dervichenko, you, know? uh, you could say beat Golovkin yeah, too. Uh, I don't think back then, though. Uh, uh, I actually, I don't remember when Charlo fought Dervichenko. But like, my point being, you know, if, if they're going to discredit, like, they're going to say the... the weight division was weak when those champions are there those are just some pretty high level champions you know now we, we can go back and forth to say who is a more higher level uh, uh champions 160 or 168 I, I i would think the champions i named off 168 would probably be had better especially i mean yeah we got charlo i'll give charlo his credit but then again he almost lost let's <laughs> yeah, yeah he, you know he, you know he almost lost so um but yeah, we, we could say he's a valid 160. But the other one, I mean, Golovkin, Canelo already beat him. And then the other one, Bobo Andrade, no one wants to fight him because he sucks. And yeah. he does not sell. Like, no one, just like Canelo said, payday, payday. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, to be honest, I, I'm, I can't really sit here and remember why. But I think maybe they was, I'm pretty sure Charlo would always say, I, I want Canelo, I want Canelo. But... I think when it actually came down to negotiations and whatnot, I don't think it was actually anything serious. Mm. N- not serious as it is now. Mm. You know, now it's different. I think now they see... I think they've waited, you know, just for in Charlo's instance. They've waited for Canelo to see if there's a chink in his armor. They think that they found it now. So I think now they want they really want to pursue that. Mm. You know, which is why he's daring to move up two weight classes now, you know. Uh, but I can't say about the other ones. I know Bobo Andrade, like... I mean, uh, he doesn't. He doesn't sell, right though. You know what I'm saying? Like, apart from him fighting a very boring style, he doesn't really sell. And I don't think he even has 
what it takes to actually yeah, he sucks. beat someone as Canelo. <laughs> He sucks. He, like he's the worst. He moved up to one sixty eight to duck um J- Jazzy Beck, yeah. the, the the guy from uh, Kazakhstan. Yeah, Kazakhstan. Yeah. yeah. Kazakh power. Kazakh power. So yeah, I don't think Bobo would would have uh, given Canelo trouble. <laughs> no. uh, who else? I think the only one what that would have actually given him given him in his actual like prime prime would have been Triple G. Yeah, Triple G. Triple G, but, but I, I mean, mean, Canelo kind of fought him in his prime. No, he no, no. Okay, or right, let's see. Triple G, he just came off of a win against Daniel Jacob, yeah? When he fought, when he fought Canelo for the Canelo, first time. Canelo, yeah, in the fall. So you're saying you're saying that uh, for the first, you know, this, that was Golovkin's last, uh, that was his first fight. He got a, like a 23 knockout streak right mm. before that fight. Mm. And then he went to the decision with Daniel Jacobs and now he's not in his prime? Sounds like he's not since his tree got broken. No, that's... You could have made the argument. No, that's disingenuous. <laughs> to say just because he didn't knock him out he isn't in his prime or he doesn't continue... Well, I mean, Canelo... Uh, uh, he waited. Because there had already been previous... A year or two previous to that uh, call for Golovkin against Canelo and Canelo wasn't... Didn't, you know, call him back. Didn't, didn't deliver with it. He fought James Kirkland. Before, uh, Triple G. Yeah, I fought Kirkland. Like I'm not saying. Yeah, I'm not saying uh, Canelo Doug. I'm I'm sure. Oh, Canelo. Yeah, I remember. I remember. We used to all be Triple G fans. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if you guys. Yeah, we're we're a big Triple G household here, and uh, fully on the train of, of Gennady Golovkin. You man, I used to hate Canelo. I was, fuck him. I was one of those haters, man. Nah, I was a hater. <laughs> so. Yeah. Uh, uh, Bro, I even had a uh, my phone case. My phone case as well. It was a Triple G, <laughs> yeah. an iPhone four case. <laughs> My phone case was a Triple G phone case, man. I, I was I was on the hype. You know, I'll be the first to admit it. Love Golovkin. Love uh, yeah, so Canelo definitely did duck him. Canelo definitely... Didn't he... Um, he vacated his... He vacated. his yeah, at one point, yeah, he did. to 154. Yeah, yeah I um, um, agree with you. But to say that Golovkin wasn't in his prime anymore is... I'd say just because... I mean, he, he, he beat Daniel Jacobs and then he fought him. Still pretty close to his prime. Let's say not his prime prime, but... You know, it's he's still he's not like a, a shell of his former self. Okay, okay. Like he is in his third fight. Like that third fight, it was a shell of his former self. Yeah, that, I mean that third fight was, was yeah he was he was yeah he's yeah. out of it. He's already old. But okay, you say he fought him at his prime. That's true. Okay, let's let's say he did fight him at his prime. Then Golovkin technically did beat Canelo in his prime because that first fight yeah was uh that was like a Golovkin fight. Come on, yeah, we, we gotta be on that. That was a Golovkin fight. Uh, and imagine if that fight would have taken place two years prior. Do you think that result would have would have been? I feel it would have been a clear Golovkin win. If not, you know he may have would have hurt Canelo more. I don't know. It's difficult to say because I mean I, I, I'm I'm thinking back to literally his last fight against Daniel Jacobs. Uh, so Triple G look he, he looked pretty good. He just didn't look as dominant. I think when someone well, we're accustomed to. Uh huh. I mean he's not gonna first of all. He's, I mean, I, I guess you could knock out everyone like Wilder, but <laughs> <laughs> the, that's that like if so is he not? You said if the fight happened two years earlier, prior to to when the fight actually happened between Canelo and Triple G, it would have been more pronounced to Triple G. But that was like a year before. I mean, he fought Daniel Jacobs. So are you saying that in the Daniel Jacobs fight, he wasn't in his prime? It's like it's it's difficult to quantify exactly when Golovkin was in his prime and when he wasn't. Now I'll give it to you. I think Golovkin did win that fight. Mm. Yeah. So it's hard to say. You know, it's I don't know. The, those things are saying oh two years earlier it could have been different. It might have. It might have not. You know, it's it's hard to say. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's kind of like um, two years prior to that, if he fought uh, Canelo in the fall, that was 2017. So two years prior would have been 2015. 2015 Golovkin was, I believe that was one of the years where uh, actually Donald Trump actually went to go see him. I think when he fought in Australia, I can't remember the guy's name, but that was a very uh, ferocious Triple G. That's almost like night and day he two was the years most ago. Fighter. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, if we're gonna get into who Triple G was knocking out, you know, he wasn't knocking out like. But can, Floyd Mayweather. Oh, but, but like what we said, he was <laughs> you know? he was he was one of the most avoided fighters yes, during that time. Yes. It was very hard. Yes. But answer me this question. No. 
<laughs> Answer me this question. What's up? Was Daniel Jacobs an improvement from Golovkin's past five fights? Yeah, Daniel Jacobs is a... Okay, so his his the level that Triple G was fighting at before was lower, meaning, of course, he's going to look better fighting these type of guys. Now, when he stepped up against Daniel Jacobs, he wasn't able to knock him out. Of course, he still won the fight. Yeah, he still won the fight, but it was much closer. So when you're saying, oh, that Triple G of the past was ferocious, well, he was ferocious because he was fighting worse fighters. You understand what I'm saying? Well, I understand, but I don't like it. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it's true. Like, you know, he he was fighting like, what, uh, Gale? He, he beat Lemieux. He beat Rosado. Even though Rosado went up, I mean, uh, Rosado. Oh, well, uh, well, but, but that's what I'm saying. It's very, it's very hard to, uh, to, to. It's very hard to have seen what Golovkin could have possibly been if these fighters weren't avoiding him. Because let's be honest, a, a, a star like him who was just he has so much hype with him. You know, he was distro- He was going through the middleweight division. No one wanted to fight him. No one wanted to fight him. He just kept knocking everyone out. No one wanted to fight him. That, Kill Brook went up to, from 147 to 160 to fight him, you know. Gave him a tough fight. It gave him... He still... He still for, a long, he still, for as long as for, for as long, for as long as he could until Golovkin just, you know, just showed that he was way too much. But my point still stands. It was, it's very hard to to get fights for him, you know, during the time. So it's kind of... I feel it's a bit hard to... Uh, to uh, to have really been able to see what maybe like a more in prime Golovkin could have been able... W- would have been able to do. So just back with age then. Your argument is is that it's back with age, like if if it was earlier, if he had bigger fights earlier, then he could have improved more. Oh yeah, easily. The, the 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 harder the fights you get, you know, early on, the more you know, the more the better you get, the more you learn from them. So, uh, I mean, you can you can make the argument that uh, uh, Lemieux was perhaps his uh, most impressive win yeah. during his run during that time, and it was his most impressive win. He uh, destroyed him. Destroyed him. He absolutely destroyed him during this. And Lemieux was also a, a, a big name during the time. The KO artist, you know, undefeated, undefeated, hard puncher too. Hard puncher. And uh, he made him look weak. He made him look like a like a rookie. You know. Mm-hmm. He he gave him he gave him a lesson, uh. So I feel I believe if you know maybe if he wasn't as it's very hard to say with with Golovkin's career based on mm-hmm. how it went you know, uh. But uh, switching topics to to Usyk okay his run <laughs> going going back to Usyk you you met, you said that Usyk had the easiest easiest run. Yeah. He's uh, a loser sorry <laughs> no 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 uh I believe he had if if it's not Josh Taylor it's him for me because. He f- yeah it's, it's between no yeah because bro Usyk's run he beat three champions who were all undefeated. He Ooh. won he won his first he won his first belt uh, 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 at cruiserweight against this I forgot his first name but his last name's like Glowaki something like that. <laughs> this this no 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 I'm telling you this man was twenty six and zero mm. Usyk was nine and zero during the time. <laughs> he beat him he you did him. Mm. Usyk would then go on and defend that belt. I think it was the WBO. He would defend the WBO for he did like three or four uh uh uh, uh, uh title defensive, one of them being Michael Hunter during the time. Mm-hmm. And then he fought in the in the world championship, you know, for the Muhammad Ali trophy. And then that's where he fought another champion, uh uh Mario Maria uh Bradis, I believe, who was also an undefeated champion, who he beat uh by split decision, I believe. And then afterwards he fought in the championship against uh Gassiv, who was the, the final champion. And then he beat Gassif by UD. And then he claimed the, the Muhammad Ali trophy. And then next fight, he fought Tony Bellew. And then he uh, sparked out Bellew. And uh, that's where he ended his, his undisputed run. But all these three champions that Usyk fought were all undefeated champions. Against Usyk, who was 9-0 and when he first fought. Who was, uh, I believe, like 13 or 14-0 and when he fought for his second one. And maybe 15-0 and when he fought for his third. When he became, a, 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 a ch- you know, a, a undisputed. So, uh... To say that Usyk had the easiest run is uh I think it's a it's a little disrespectful because I, I believe Usyk had one of if not the hardest run at undisputed. The most impressive thing about his run is that he did it at a early part of his career. Let's say nine fights, like you said, his first world title. Not taking into consideration his three hundred amateur fights, you know. Mm. Um, but the thing is. You keep on referring to this undefeated thing as if that 
determines if he's a if they're like pound for pound or something. Listen, officers. yeah, I don't know any of those motherfuckers. <laughs> I'm gonna be honest. <laughs> <laughs> and I know a lot of undefeated guys. Yeah, they could be undefeated, man. That don't mean they're it. You know, that don't mean they got they got the 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 sauce. That don't mean they're they're nice. They're smooth with it. So, uh, yeah, I, I just can't give it. Like me personally, I couldn't give it to him unless I understood these guys' career and actually saw them. And they were like, cause listen, yeah, we we've been boxing fans for a while. If if they were like good, out would have hurt. <laughs> And I think it goes back to the thing, like, what have they done? Mm. What are they doing now? Mm. Yeah. Uh, are they really good? Like, was, was Zuzik really that good that he, he got all these guys out? Once he moved up, they're like, okay, let's go get our belts back. <laughs> yeah. You know? And, you know, that zero doesn't mean that they're good. You know mm. what I'm saying? They could have been built up and then mm. whatever, whatever it is. Yeah, the Cruiserweight has also always kind of been um, neglected. Yeah, because yeah, it's kind of in a weird position where it's like, it's right before heavyweight where if if people want to see big guys, they would just watch the heavyweights. They won't be like, oh, let me watch the second biggest guys. It's like, no, I'm going to see some big boys, some giants. Um, so they go watch the heavyweights. And then uh, right right uh, before them is the uh, uh, light heavyweight, yeah. which is much more interesting as well, 175. Much more better fights, much more better fighters. The, like Andre Ward was over there. Kovalev uh, was over there during the time, you know. And still, like to this day, and even back in the day, um, the the cruiserweight division wasn't really talked about because there wasn't a star in it. Not just from for the fame, but also for the skill. Usyk made that division because he was better than all those guys. Because those guys, on a balance of probability, probably were not the best guys. That's why they didn't have the promotional backing. They didn't have the media backing. They didn't have you know all this backings. And that's why we, I never heard of them because probably weren't that good and they were in that division, you know? Okay, so you, you, you made the point that they were undefeated, but they, you didn't know them. Uh, they weren't pound for pound. Same argument could be made to the 168 when Canelo went in there. Mm. Billy Jones on there was not pound for pound. Callum Smith no. was not pound for pound. No. Caleb Plant was not pound for pound. None mm. of those three champions were pound for pound. Mm-hmm. Yes, they were undefeated. But they weren't also they weren't pound for pound, so I f- that argument could be also used on um, the one sixty eight. Mm-hmm. That's true, but I had heard of Billy Joe Saunders. Just because you have heard of him doesn't no, mean that, no, he, that I, he's I more... say that because because I know boxing. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Trust me. Like, <laughs> hey, listen, I, I'm not a you know I, I'm in boxing, so like I. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I know the fighters, man. I'm up to date, you know. I'm not a casual. I so, should, <laughs> you know. Listen, like, but, 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 think about it. Like, for us, right? We know me and Roberto, right? Uh, all three of us have watched boxing since we were very young, years. right? We, yeah, we years. years, years of experience. We've been in the box. It's not like I just found out about Usyk or I just found out about all these guys. We've obviously been in boxing for a long time. We've seen a lot of great fighters, a lot of, you know, big guys in the sport. And my boxing knowledge, just like... All... Sorry about that. Uh, technical difficulties. But, uh, yeah. Uh, let us know what you guys think in the poll. Who had the hardest row for the Undisputed Crown? Crawford, Canelo, Usyk, and Josh Taylor. Uh, let us know. Because right now, Canelo, I believe, is still ahead. So... Until then, it's been your boy Roberto. Uh, Pablo. The Boxing Encyclopedia, Asael. And this has been the last round, Boxing Podcast. Peace.